Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here and it's nice to see everybody. I wish it was in person, but uh, always nice to get together. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about work uh, with like four papers with Andrea and also the pleasure of working with uh, grad student Virgo Pano and uh, Emilio, who's going to be uh, leading or perhaps leading the discussion session right after me. So in each of those papers, we're basically looking at um, basically spin shifting relations and um, conformal multiplet structures. So that's the title of this talk is going to be just, I guess, a graphical description of um, basically the tendency relations and uh, SUSY relations that tie together various soft there. So that's what the name is coming from. Okay, so just because I drew a pyramid and a sphinx on the other side, I should remind that we are in Greece supposedly right now. So it's a slightly different mythology. And um, ironically enough, I guess, or like you can force it to be true, um, the, of course, our subfield is basically some variant of uh, the riddle of the Sphinx, uh, where we're studying quantum gravity in four dimensions, but we have a 2D description. And then depending on if you want to look at null infinity, that U direction or the like, behavior in delta makes it look like it lives in three dimensions. So we, we know the answer to the riddle of the Sphinx. <laughs> now we can go from Thebes back to Corfu. And uh, today, the outline of the talk, um, so the, so the goal for my talk is going to be trying to emphasize within uh, this conformal multiple structure uh, the connections to various things that a lot of people here are talking about or working on. So while the content of the slides, you might see some overlap with what I was saying at um, at OIST and developing that like sense, like whenever we're talking about things, let's try to keep in mind how to relate it to what you guys are doing. So so that's going to be the, the main goal. But the outline for now is we're going to start with generalized primaries and then celestial operators, how we define them via the center product with these primaries. Um, and then moving on to the celestial diamond structure with Emilio and Andrea, and then finally how they tie together into the celestial pyramid. So that's the outline for today. So let's just get right into it. Okay, so starting with the definition, which is familiar to a lot of those who are on the celestial amplitude side of things. Uh, basically, so a conformal primary wave function is going to be a function of a bulk point and a reference direction. And we want under a specific transformation of both the bulk point and this reference direction, which we think of as living on the celestial sphere. So I'm in 40 right now, uh, has a certain transformation property. And so if uh, I normally have, uh, in a lot of the papers with Shuhang, for instance, we were looking at basically S equals J, absolute value of J. And so that's restricting you to radiate to the four primaries. But if you look at massless scattering and you relax that, that's where you're gonna be able to get the structure where uh, the celestial pyramid is gonna be a function of S, delta, and J as the three directions in which you can move around. So for radiative conformal primaries, I'm not gonna relax that. I'm gonna say that it's uh, for massless guys, S equals J, they solve the appropriate source-free equations of motion. And this representation here is for that corresponding helicity. And then for generalized conformal primaries, I'm gonna relax a lot of that. Now, in some instances, I still want it to be a solution to the equation of motion so I can construct the appropriate external particle states. But there are interesting contexts where you're looking at um, non-trivial backgrounds uh, corresponding to shock waves or whatever, where you can construct something that also transforms in this manner, but will have a source. Okay, so then what one can do is, of course, if I want to construct my dictionary, so my local primary operator is defined in terms of if I have a, a bulk local operator um, in the product and also a uh, my conformal primary wave function, then I can construct uh, this operator that manifestly transforms like it should uh, in uh, as a conformal primary in, in two dimensions or D minus two generally. So one thing to point in mind here is that formally speaking, if we were in the free theory, we could of course do this on any Cauchy slice. Um, now we want to study theory of quantum gravity. So we should really be worried about saying that there's this both local operators, but in practice, if we end up pushing our Cauchy slice to the boundary, we're essentially saying that these, um, however, the theory is behaving at null infinity is in some sense free. We have this like boundary description of those operators. So the nice thing about this is this can be kind of phrased to set up a basically extrapolate style dictionary where um, you're just tying, tethering uh, the fields at the boundary and then by uh, performing the appropriate convolution in terms of this inner product between uh, three solutions to the wave equation, uh, you now have this manifest the transforming the right way object that you want that you say is the celestial primary. So this step is important also for understanding, I guess, um, elements of the, like understanding quantization in Hilbert space, et cetera. Like it's nice to have both a 4D picture and then a 2D picture of every step that you're doing. So you can kind of see what makes sense. Um, so one thing that's slightly fun about it is if anything, um, you'll see with Banerjee's part of the discussion session today, 
is that you can get a lot with even just the global symmetries. And so the starting point that we're going from is, off, is inspired by some of the earlier work of Banerjee, and you've seen what he's done with it since, uh, where he's a lot of powerful constraints on um, the um, like differential equations that uh, correlators have to satisfy. Um, so what the nice thing about it, though, is it basically you can tie a lot of statements down just to things that hold from the level of the kinematics and the symmetries um, that you make manifest by the, your choice of, of external scattering states. And so uh, essentially, I could say one of the themes of the works with Andrea and also early with Laura is to kind of pin down um, kind of aspects that come from the level of that kinematics that are just getting guaranteed by looking at the wave function. So it's kind of nice. And then with this picture in mind, we also have now a bulk interpretation of these uh, states that we're creating. So again, you can kind of like use that as a reality check for um, if you're to make a claim about this 2D CFT, and if you're changing, for instance, like in, in Eddie's like state operator correspondence shadowing the out state, what does that mean in the bulk? You know what it means. So you can kind of like try to, to pin things together because you know both sides of the dictionary or you know where you're making a change to, to certain assumptions there. Okay, so now if my task is just, I wanna build up these wave functions, right? So I can view the fact that, okay, I'm not going to say that I need my um, 40 uh, helicity to match the, the value of the spin. I'm just going to try to write everything down so that there's these three labels that it transforms covariantly under. What I would do is I need the following building blocks. The first thing is my scalar. So the scalar guy, the standard Mellon transform of the plane wave gives you this one over negative Q dot X to the delta. And then of course, because X is a Lorenz invariant, it's basically the only Lorenz invariant you have sitting around as a function of the space time. I can just multiply by a function of x squared, and you know that that won't change the covariance properties that I was demanding on, on the previous slide. However, of course, it will change whether or not this is a solution to a given equation of motion, so it's important to have that there. Um, then if you want to add in uh, a, uh, basically, the, there's a bulk spin, which would be this index mu or the spinner index, or a um, boundary spin, which is the value of j, uh, those aren't necessarily the same, and one can see that by basically breaking uh, down into a covariant tetrad, um, a, tetra, a big basis for the tangent space and Minkowski space. So what we're basically doing right here is we're just writing down a standard normalized with normal tetrad for Minkowski space that also respects the standard um, transformation properties that we defined before. And so one important thing about this, like generalizing the definition is that of course, when we're talking about constructing external states, we want our wave functions to satisfy the appropriate equations of motion. But if we want to just write in terms of building blocks, then these individual building blocks won't necessarily do the same thing. So um, right now, what we see is like basically each of these guys will have weight delta, so they won't change the weight of the wave function. Uh, but their spin will be plus or minus one for these radiative guys, and basically these longitudinal guys, which you'll see in certain shockwave solutions, are uh, delta equals zero. So they have the standard orthonormality conditions, and they further decompose into a spin frame. And so this is where um, the other part of the talk with, with fermions comes in is basically, I want to also look at uh, wave functions that now are, are spinner value. So we can do that all within this framework of saying, demanding covariance properties and pushing through with it. Okay, so for a given spin, like, so I fixed my value of S for the bulk field. And so I know that I want this field to transform in a certain representation of, of the Lorenz group in 4D. Uh, then I can construct wave functions with any j less than or equal to s, which is like either integer modded or half integer modded spin, uh, by just taking tensor products of my scalar, my free function of x squared, and um, my um, tetrad and spin frame, and like sums over the independent uh, versions of those that I can build up. So for the case of the, this is just trying to show how you reproduce the, the stuff with Xu Hung, which is the radiative guy with spin one, will have my spin one tetrad element, my free function of x squared and my scalar primary. And for delta equals zero, uh, whatever delta, but j equals zero, I have two possible linear combinations that I could do. So then I take that on sets, which is just from the symmetries. And now I say, okay, I want it to satisfy various either gauge conditions or the equations of motion. So the equations of motion is the more important one here for the, for the construction with that inner product. Uh, but one can see essentially from the first line that um, the act of saying that this radiative wave function, which is source free is actually a conformal primary is itself basically a gauge fixing condition. So the consistency of radial gauge and um, and harmonic gauge was something that we were like like lucky in um, in, in in the paper to shoot to, to see that it was a consistent when it's um, source free. And here, basically, I think a nicer approach is to say, well, that is kind of like the gauge fixing that you're doing. So um, of course, when you actually talk about the operators, if you're not looking at correlation functions, like you can. Um, the there will be like gauge transformations in those transformation properties of, in the Hilbert space. 
but um, basically for the external states, we can make a gauge choice, which is saying it's conformal primary. And so then of course you have to satisfy now the equations of motion in that gauge, which are just now the harmonic equation. And when you do that, you get two solutions, which are of course the shadow and the, the non-shadow primaries. So that's the route for the radiative guys. And now when you repeat it for the non-radiative guys, curiously enough, this system of equations actually does have a set of unique solutions. Um, so if you want to satisfy everything that the, the uh, radiative guys uh, satisfy for this non-radiative guy, you're going to really just isolate yourself down to what we're going to see is related to a descendancy relation uh, in this celestial diamond picture. So J equals S and primary amounts to gauge fixing. And we have that our radiative solutions have these two options, but any value of delta is allowed. And of course, delta on the principal series uh, and like was um, shown to basically capture the, the finite energy radiative states and with Laura, how to analytically, analytically continue off the principal series there. So now, of course, the question of operator spectrum is actually twofold. And this is something that was very nicely like um, raised by uh, Andy, Laura, and Andrea at one point. Uh, is basically to understand what's happening in the conformally soft limit. So first of all, you have issues with shadow redundancies that are appearing uh, in, in, in that limit. And then also um, the fact that when you look at delta off the principal series, that's where you get these currents that you're seeing, like the stress sensor comes from delta equals zero shadow. So the there's I, I would say that there's two questions for the operator spectrum. The first one is, OK, so I'm still radiative, but my values of the conformal dimension now seem to need to be off of the principal series. What do you do? And the paper with uh, Andrea and Laura, we were trying to address that as this analytic continuation of the data on the principal series. So it's like you're not over complete. Um, so then the papers that I get to present today are about the second question, which is what's the role of the um, wave function such that the, the value of J doesn't match the value of the spin, even though you are um, massless. So it's not like you're just projecting a polarization tensor down um, in the massive case. So that's like not like aligned with the normal to the celestial sphere or whatever. So, um, basically now what I want to say is for the first situation, um, what we were looking at originally is the, the, the special principal series guys not only have this feature where if you look at the two point function, you have this orthonormality condition on the principal series, but you also have the appropriate, um, space time fall offs for the contact terms and for the shadow you have it for the non contact terms. And so from the point of view of someone who's looking at the asymptotic symmetry analysis and saying, well, I want makes to make sure that I'm not just looking at solutions that are not really in my physical phase space because of the boundary conditions for them. Um, there's this funny um, constraints on the spectrum in the following sense. So basically, if you wanted to um, do your extrapolate style lecture studies implicitly in all of the soft theorem derivations, we're basically saying, OK, I can show that the word identity equals a soft theorem because I am taking um, my like basically looking at not the expectation value, but the action of my operator, which I know in space time, acting only Hilbert space, and that involves taking a larger limit, which induces a saddle point. And so implicitly, if you do that saddle point and then you're melon transforming, um, there's a certain uh, order of limits there with the values of the conformal dimensions for which that converges. And so you'll see the principal series is also kind of just um, on that edge or like, which it needs to be because you have to like, basically if it fall off too fast, it wouldn't be there. If it felt like if it grew too much, you'd be worried about it. Uh, where the saddle point for these these non shadowed voids is is what you would pick out in that order of limits and basically gives you uh, this operator supported along future null infinity say for the outstate. Um, and so the question of um, what values of the conformal dimension you want to look at is not so innocent in the sense that like okay fine I can worry about completeness. Um, like basically, I should, one should be worried also about the physical implications in phase space and like the, the boundary conditions for these guys when you're when you're changing the values of delta. And so that part of that question is is interplayed here, and that's what I just wanted to emphasize. So for the most of this talk, though, I'm going to be worried about the second part of the question, or basically, um, like because we're coming up with these various issues. So first of all, delta off the principal series uh, somehow it's not part of the basis. Also, there's concerns about whether or not it falls off appropriately in space time, but I somehow need it. I also see these shadows that are appearing. So these kind of like um, this culmination of different questions regarding these conformally soft limits leads you to try to look at also the, the non-radiative guys because they're gonna be connected through these ascendancy structures. So that's what the focus of the talk is today. Okay, so I wanna be able to analytically continue, analytically continue off the principal series. And for very special values of Delta, I find that there are pure gauge modes. And so another question um, that arises is the following is that, Basically, the leading uh, and subleading gravitational soft theorem, leading EM soft theorem, um, and 
same thing with the gluonic case. There, there are certain soft theorems that are kind of easier for you. Like you kind of already know what asymptotic symmetry is, and then you can see that the work of Quigley and Lada had to do a, dig a bit harder to find an asymptotic symmetry interpretation for uh, the subleading guys. Now, I'm not going to say anything about like a no-go on that, but I will say that when you say that I'm gauge fixing to being a conformal primary, and then just trying to read off what value of the spectrum it becomes pure gauge, in that case, you're guaranteed to have basically what amounts to the soft charge operator. So if I just did a very naive uh, Chung et al. style, uh, here is my wave functions, where is it pure gauge? I can read off for you all of the quote unquote the universal soft theorems, which also don't have as many subtleties with how they give loop corrections, et cetera. So um, this is not a no-go. So I'm not saying that you can't you can't have an asymptotic symmetry interpretation for the others, but as far as a conformally uh, soft or conformally covariant asymptotic symmetry interpretation, the easiest ones are these guys here. And so part of what I'm also going to talk about today is to try to unify uh, all these extra soft theorems with uh, a structure that kind of incorporates them nicely rather than seeming like they are the odd ones that don't quite fit in. So what I'm just saying right now is again, um, connecting both um, the supersymmetric versions and the non-supersymmetric versions. So we have, it's, uh, it's been one, just the leading soft theorem, gravity has the leading and subleading guys. And then um, at supersymmetry, the spin three half guy also has a pure gauge version of the soft theorem. And that was a recent paper with, with your girl Annie here that we're looking at. So that's nice that we can quite easily look at the large R behavior of this guy that we know is pure gauge and literally identify the wave function as being, okay, yes, this induces a large pure gauge. And so I'm literally just looking at the profile for the field at infinity and seeing that it matches the gold sum for the corresponding asymptotic symmetry from the point of view of just what it's one over our falloffs are. So you know what this is from the wave function, you know this because it's pure gauge. And so basically the fact that it then is a current is also guaranteed for you, but the fact that it's just given soft theorem, you have to do a little bit of work, I guess, to see that again, it's kind of can be guessed from the conformal dimension that this is the right value of the, the power of omega, but um, like the, the work by um, various authors, including like Andrea, Alfredo, um, and, um, and Kate and Anna, um, showing that you can extract that soft theorem um, rather than just see it if it's like dominating with a pole and, and delta or something like that. So that's all good. But of course, there are um, basically there should be a more general structure that can account for not only these guys, but also um, this most subleading soft theorems and this infinite tower like W infinity that's been uh, the hot topic right now. So we want to uh, basically talk about celestial diamonds, uh, which are Emilio is going to go into a little bit more detail about the classification program um, from the point of view of uh, CFT, uh, why like you would look at primary descent, et cetera. But essentially, if you kind of are inspired by the work of uh, the early work of energy, uh, you can notice that a lot of the structure is actually can be found just by looking at the global conformal multiplets. And then you see that there are necessary relations between um, various soft modes in their shadows or various soft modes of different helicities, as well as these non radiative solutions that were appearing from like solving basically everything you could demand, except for the fact that, that it's not uh, J equals S. So a primary state is going to be annihilated by two of the Lorentz generators and have definite weight under L0 and L0 bar. And then I'm basically I'm just taking W derivatives to descend and look at uh, the global conformal descendants on those guys. And when I do so, I can sometimes, depending on the value of the dimension, find a uh, primary descendant. And so in the context where uh, basically that primary descendant is zero, then you really do have these finite dimensional multiplets. Um, but in other contexts, it's not obvious that that primary descendant is actually null in the standard sense. And this has to do with a little bit of the, the inner product in the Hilbert space. And this is something where effectively um, you will get basically contact terms that we're going to see later. Oh, Andy has a question. Yeah. Sabrina, can you comment? Um, yeah. We use, we, so the right hand side of your diagram is, I guess, positive felicity, and the left hand side is negative felicity. Sometimes, I mean, it's a little bit, it's either the shadow of it or it is that. I guess that, that's kind of my question. Um, so how, how are we supposed to think about the fact, we, th we usually, we would think of those as independent fields. Yeah. But now in your picture, you, you, when you go all the way down to the bottom, you get, um, you get the same thing from a positive velocity and a negative velocity. Is that saying that they're not, that is saying it for the leading cases. So what's happening is the following. So right now when I'm descending, I am descending from the delta equals zero soft theorem on one side. And on the other side, I'm looking at the stress tensor. So those guys are related by this shadow operation. And so 
one thing, um, so, so that doesn't impose a helicity relation, but one does find though, is that of course the leading- wait, the, uh, left and, uh, the left and the right are related by, wait, which are shadow? So, so the left and the right are gonna be related by shadow, but the left and the right are not the melon transform primaries. They're literally the shadow primary. So the only case where you have a helicity redundancy is the leading soft theorem. So basically the same way that the soft theorem for the um, plus helicity- Sorry, I, I didn't understand that sentence. I thought the yeah. left and the right were the usual melon primaries. Not in this, no, only for some not of the, in this only picture. the leading one. Not in this picture, not generically. Not generically. Which is good because basically what happens is that you need, um, like- But this so picture it, would be, this diagram would be true if they were the melon primaries, wouldn't it? No, 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 wait, so, so, so here's what happens. Okay, so if you look at the melon primaries, then the other corner is its shadow. For the leading soft theorem, that is the other melon primary. So there really is a redundancy, and I think the best way to handle it is to look at the dressing modes. For these guys, um, you have basically um, the memory and the goldstone diamonds are basically sitting right on top of each other. And so like the, you have the stress tensor, and then you have the dual stress tensor from the paper with Adam, for instance, sitting at that corner. I see. On top of each other, which is which is good because I mean, it, like, it kind of shows that for the leading case, you really do kind of have to add those those goldstone modes to your face space. So the guys that are I'm going to say are at the top of the diamond, and then these these shadows never need to be put in by hand. So so basically, it, it doesn't conflict with with those with those observations, but it does give a kind of natural interpretation for certain uh, effective field theory models for what will be at the top of the diamond, for instance. And there, one can avoid introducing shadows by hand. Now, of course, there are natural situations where you want to shadow or smear to make these like um, correlators not singular. But from the point of view of a purist saying like, do I need to do this? Do I, can, I, can I say that my dictionary is this local operator? Is this melon transform? Or do I need to, like, it would be a, like a problem, I would say, to say that I, I only have my local operators being melon guys. And then every once in a while for the current, I need to smear it because now it's this non-local operator in the CFT. So if you say, instead, I'm gonna add a local operator at the top of the diamond, then it's gonna to descend to the ones that you need. And so basically you'd like, it's a moderate change to the dictionary as opposed to smearing everything, for instance. So that's one, one approach to this, but it won't, it won't get in the way of, of, the, of, of the, the intuition that you have. So there are two, two pictures, there are two diamonds. You could have another diamond where you shadow everything on this diamond. Exactly, and they're sitting right on top of each other. So for instance, if I'll, I guess I'll, uh, it, it'll be easier maybe when I have like numbers at these things, but um, like you can have a, a state here and then the shadow state for it, that Delta right on top of it, but it's shadow is the one with two minus Delta, right? So like, like the O H tilde sub O from zero versus H sub zero are, are like not shadows of each other, but they're like, they're the shadow mode of the reflected guy, so. And is the light transform moving us up the diagonals? Indeed, indeed, indeed it does. So from the point of view of the group theoretic person, like you can see that it's, the shadow is basically a double wild reflection. And so, um, I mean, maybe you can also argue that that's necessary for, for, the, for SL2C versus SL2R versus SL2R, but the analog of the light transform up to an appropriate regular, we have to regulate it a little bit to make sure that it works. It's a Green's function for, the, um, for, for just flipping up one of them. Is it, where is that explained? Is that explained somewhere? Uh, hopefully to come in. <laughs> so we're like, there, there's some lovely, there's a lovely paper that I, that like, yeah, I, <laughs> I, I hope that we could just like say, yeah, but yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, so yeah, so that'll be worked out. And essentially it's a, it's a small change to the next observation that the tool also has. So like, that's where I, <laughs> I want to say late, later. Um, but basically, so essentially what's happening there is you you have the shadow you can think of as a greens function for certain um, differential operators which in the shadow case it's basically you're inverting one then descending again um but you can also think of just inverting uh one leg or the other okay so i don't want to get too far into this aspect of uh the the hilbert space inner product because i feel like there's others here who also have studied this more in depth and maybe um emilio can point on this more but basically one should be just slightly cautious of saying that if it's a primary descendant, that it's null. Ideally, I think one does want to, so I'd say that there's kind of two philosophies within celestial CFT. There's the one where I say, I am gonna stick with what I have and use my 4D dictionary to build up some 2D guy and reassess everything I know from the yellow book uh, at every step that I'm doing. So when I do that, then like, 
just because I would take it for granted in, in the 2D CFT context doesn't mean I should. Then there's the kind of purest, or like maybe not purest point of view, but there's the other point of view where can I make this 4D problem look like a standard, not vanilla, but maybe chocolate and melon or whatever, like slightly exotic, but more like a 2D CFT. Um, so if I do that, then this is where you want to smear operators and everything. You want it to be um, like, the, like you don't want the low point functions to look singular. And on top of that, you probably do want to have some analog of your state operator correspondence where you understand how whatever you're doing to the out state really does give you the standard like L's and L bars, um, like, like the, that conjugation should affect them in the same way that it does in TDCP. So, so I think it's fruitful to, to study both approaches because um, in the end, it's basically some sort of an intertwining between different representations of, of the same structure, which is the, the amplitude to begin with. Um, so, but just pointing out that as it is, the way that the Hermitian conjugation works on these operators Li doesn't, um, doesn't enforce you to have basically a, a zero uh, inner product when you are a primary descendant. So just keep that in mind. But it does end up behaving in a very similar way in the sense that the guys at the bottom of the diamonds will essentially only reduce to contact terms in correlators. And so that's very much like operator equations in 2D CFT. So, so I think that there's there's nothing there um, conflicting with the fact that there could be a natural interpretation where primary descendants are null like in 2D CFT. So just saying that, but it is something where one should be a little bit careful because the kind of fun thing about it is that some of these descendants are manifestly not zero as far as wave functions are concerned. And so then you want to understand why those wave functions are reducing to contact terms. And then that will tie nicely, I believe, into um, the uh, BMS Fox stuff that like Laura just had a paper on and then hopefully I think Barnett is going to be talking about today. Or not today. Sabrina, you have a final... Oh, oh sorry. Five minutes, yeah, yeah. Three, yeah. Ah, see, that's why I was worried. I, I, like, I cut these things like that. Okay, good. okay, so let's just go through this. Perfect. So, okay, so we have an infinite tower of radius primaries. Okay, so when we just do that classification, we actually have a full tower of those values of the normal dimension. And so you have these W infinity guys coming from, um, I think it includes these, these, these soft theorems that I'm most interested in, but also extends to ones where basically you descend to zero at the bottom of the diamond. So for values of delta that are negative enough, you can see that the one of for q dot x to the negative delta is like to an integer power. So you can take enough w derivatives, it's going to give you zero. So that's essentially how you see that. And so, and the, that structure of the component multiplex is you have this primary at the top, and each of the left and right descendants just vanish. What will happen though in the case where there's soft theorems is you're going to have the primary that is the conformally soft theorem being either the left or the right corner of the diamond. Its shadow is going to be at the other corner. And then they descend to the soft operator, and that structure was first investigated by Banerjee, for instance. Um, and so the nice thing about that basically is that um, when you see the descendancy structure, then you can also kind of lift it up and then try to interpret the top of the diamond and the bottom of the diamond as basically these paired modes. So this is, when you look at the conformal dimensions in the BMS flux literature, what you're seeing is you're seeing these weights corresponding to either the top of the diamond, which is the goldstone mode for them, or the bottom of the diamond, which is a symplectic partner, which um, would be the, um, the charge mode. Now, the fun thing about it also when it comes to trying to connect this to the story of OPEs um, and like these global symmetries is that essentially what's happening is I have right now, I'm just looking at the soft operator. So I'm basically taking all the soft theorems and sending down. The constraint equations, of course, relate that to other hard operators, which have to be sitting at this value of uh, the formal dimension to have a, a non-trivial um, like ward identity. So basically you have something that's a primary descendant plus something that's not a primary descendant equals zero in your S matrix element. And so if you steer that object to something where it would be annihilated by the kernel for these descendants, then you're going to get your global symmetries. So, so that structure is, this, that's how this, it's just kind of nice that you can look at the descendancy structure and kind of see the same things that are very important to then finding these uh, recursion relations for OPs, for instance. So, so I just want to emphasize that like we're doing this kind of very, like kind of like kids exercise, maybe like looking at derivatives of things. And we're seeing all these very nice structures coming out. So, um, so the, the shadow relation was one to emphasize, but I think we talked about that with Andy basically now. And then of course the stressing and the soft thing, um, these basically these two diamonds on top of each other is what I was just mentioning. So for the sake of like, just at least getting through all the, <laughs> to the pyramid part of it, um, for the, the, there's one degenerate case where basically for the most subliding guys, you are descending from one primary to its shadow. And, um, and so that has been the subject of more recent investigation because it's the one where you expect there to be some sort of uh, symmetry interpretation, but it's somehow just not quite there. 
Um, and these are also the ones that give you some interesting recursion relations with OPEs. So just pointing out that they are the sentence makes it a little bit easier because then you only have to do one computation to evaluate the soft charge, for instance, because you can take a derivative to find the other. So um, that's just one thing to point out. It's about the degenerate cases. You're moving from the top of the diamond for very negative integer values of delta to the left or right corner, then down to the bottom. Like, Basically, instead of to the bottom, it degenerates to this. Like it is both the bottom and the top corner because of this. This this um, th this tilde could be you could shadow both of them, and it would also be an operator at the bottom of the diamond. So basically, that's the nice structure there. We can go through the leading soft theorems if we want to, but for the interest of time, I'll just be brief because I think some of the stuff was said. Um, basically, for the leading case, there is this shadow redundancy between the two guys, and so you see that coming from if I just added a dressing mode at the top, that it would basically manifestly make that for you. Um, and also the same conformal dimension for the top of the diamond corresponds to an Eichelberg sets of geometry. So if you're interested in chalk wave solutions or non-trivial, non-perturbative backgrounds, that's your go-to guy. For the subletting soft graviton, you no longer have the shadow redundancy, but you do see that the stress tensor and um, the dual stress tensor are basically on top of each other as different diamonds. They smear from uh, the stress tensor smears from the delta equals zero guy, and that then um, those um, basically like you can basically include both the stress tensor and its shadow by including basically a, a diffeomorphism mode. And this is the one that I believe like Kevin and others have studied, um, which is this like spontaneous symmetry breaking for this diff S2 mode um, parameterized in terms of like um, essentially like a, a vector, uh, like a, a Y of Z on the, on the sphere that's like spontaneously broken. So you're looking at like the super rotation or the, the diff S2 vector field mode breaking to, to, to one or the other um, symmetry. OK, so then, of course, the nice thing about uh, what I want to say for the purpose of the title of the talk is that you can extend this to any uh, spin. And if you look at this, they look like they almost want to be on top of each other, especially if you look at the zero and, and the, the delta and j values for the center of those guys. And so um, for one thing, which is kind of what I mentioned, is that the top of the diamond, you have the stressing. Uh, you can look at the conformally soft sector and have some interesting EFT interpretations there. Um, and similarly, that's where the levels come from. But for the purpose of this talk, and so I don't um, not give justice to this lovely work with with, uh, with Andrea and with Yorgo, um, we were all in, in most of the talk, I've been talking about just moving within the same value of the uh, spin of the field, but different values of J. And we found that there are nice interpretations where it still is a spin S field, but now J is going to be less than S. And it corresponds at the bottom of the diamond where there's a soft operator charge at the top where there's a dressing and it descends to the radiative guys. Um, you can also move between values of S using um, a Taylor and others have developed, which is these Suzy just supersymmetry in, in the Mellon basis. And so what one finds is that basically I have all of these um, individual SL2C descendants, and then they're stacked together and tied together with the supersymmetry relations. And so nicely enough, that explains why, like, if you look at the diamond, um, the soft operators sitting here or here or here. Uh, essentially all come from um, different values of spin, but like the most, uh, the rightmost, so like the, the positive felicity soft theorems. And then the reason why the parameters for those charges are the same when you write it in terms of um, like making an isomorphism between the ward identity and the soft theorem is because basically they're descendant that uh, they're, you have to descend a different number of times down to the soft operator, but the same number of times up to the shadow, for instance. And so you can explain some nice properties there and that but I won't go too far into it for the sake of, of not uh, leading into the uh, discussion session. So what I wanna show, close off at the end, is that basically, uh, hopefully I did a little bit of what I promised, which is present the celestial diamonds and how they tie together into the celestial pyramid in a manner that reflects some of the interesting results that other people at this conference are talking about. So thank you guys so much for your time and I'm um, happy to take any questions. Related by the light transform to the usual one, right? Yeah, it that's what you're yeah. saying. Yeah. yeah. So, so they can be pretty explicitly described. This log business doesn't come up for super translations because you see it literally in the correlators, right? Like you see that in your in your two point correlators for your C in the, in the paper with Mina and um, and uh, and right, yeah. right. Oh, right. There were logs yes. there. So basically, I mean, the point of view that Amelia was saying is exactly what I would say is like, we aren't handed these, I mean, you can do the route that Kevin and and um, and, and Jacob do, which is start from the full gravitational theory and then try to find effective modes for like the, the goldstones. But if you wanted to kind of excavate things from the, the soft theorems, this is how you would build it up and identify where you need to augment the spectrum. So that's the point of view and yeah.